makers and market movers. This is The Pulse with Francine Lockwood. Good morning and welcome to The Pulse. I'm Kriti Gupta in London. In just a few moments, we're headed to the Bloomberg's New Economy Forum in Singapore. Our very own Francine Lockwell will be speaking to the UBS Group CEO, Sergio Armati. It's an interview you do not want to miss after not only their earnings conversation today, but of course, their massive acquisition of Credit Suisse. Plus, later in the hour on Bloomberg UK, we're going to recap the King speech, the latest figures from the UK property market, plus Bloomberg Economics, explaining why it thinks the UK is already in the recession everyone's warning about. But before we dive into that, let's take a quick look at the European market story, because, of course, there is going to be a lot of cross currents. Remember, earnings are coming out fast and furious, but you're actually seeing some green on the screen. A lot of the outperformance coming from the French benchmark there, and that's going to be crucial, again, as we talk about the outperformance. Where is the regional outperformance? The IBEX not far behind the FTSE MIB as well. But if you actually look as well at, say, even where the FTSE 100 stands in comparison, you are seeing a lag there as well. But let's go to what the bond market is pricing in, because as at its core is going to be, nope, we're going right back to the equity market. Don't worry, they're both very, very interesting. Let's go to the equity market first. Forgive us uh, for, for all the back and forth there. But the green on the screen from the equity market is going to be a function of the bond market. And that thing, that's the core of the point that I'm trying to get to, because, of course, at the core of all these earnings stories that are driving the equity market are the margins story. And that's what you're seeing from a lot of these companies as well. They are actually coming out with higher margins, which wouldn't be the focus if inflation wasn't actually the issue at heart. Yet it is. And that, I think, is really where the bond market and the equity market are on two completely different pages. Nevertheless, what you need to know is that there are some pretty significant movers today, which brings me to the companies that you need to know. Our, one of our top movers, one of the biggest index contributors, by the way, to the Stocks 600 is going to be Adia. And this is, of course, the payments company, higher by 31%, giving the street quite a bit of reassurance. And that is a really big deal because, of course, payments right now have a massive, a massive, massive, massive burden to lift here in simply saying that they're putting out these new targets. They are non-profitable tech companies, and they're basically having to prove their own worth. Adyen, on the other hand, gaining, well, now 31%, but it was as high as about 37% intraday. Their new targets largely seem more realistic. Their guidance coming down a little bit, but really providing a lot of relief for those investors who are saying, can they actually eventually hit some of their targets. That's just one of the positive moves. I'm going to skip down to the bottom and talk about AstraZeneca for a second because those earnings coming in positively as well. Now, one of the concerns around AstraZeneca was simply this idea that after the COVID vaccines, where are their next lead of revenue going to come from? But it's actually obesity that's coming to the rescue, specifically the drug that actually targets patients with obesity and diabetes as well. Now, they've had a new agreement with a Chinese biotech company that could be worth as much as $2 billion, but it is still experimental. Nevertheless, creating a little bit of reassurance in the market. Those shares higher by 3.2% as well. To the downside, though, and these are going to be your two biggest weights on the, S, uh, the stock 600, excuse me, is going to be Airbus, down about 1.5%, and Novo Nordisk as well, down about 1% as well. I want to go to Novo Nordisk first because that is a stock that is really reacting quite heavily to what you're seeing in the U.K. Again, an FDA approval getting a little bit of a uh, uh, approval for an obesity drug, a ZEP bound over in the United States, that is direct competition with Novo Nordisk's own candidate for that. And therefore, that competition story down about 1.2 percent. Airbus as well, down about 1.5 percent, as we really worry about just whether or not they're going to be able to make their delivery targets. Again, those are your biggest movers on the day. I want to get a quick uh, check on the bond market as well. And that's where I think the Fed cuts conversation really, really matters. And this is the, the story I want to tell you here, because when you look at at the moves in terms of financial conditions index. We've seen a lot of easing from there. Um, you've seen less volatility in the market. I'm sure all of that's going to come into conversation when we go to Bloomberg's New Economy Forum in Singapore for a conversation between UBS Group CEO Sergio Armadi and our very own Francine Lockwood. Take a listen. Start fast. Um, thank you, everyone, for joining us. I mean, the macroeconomy, and we we've just were listening to a panel is all over the place at the moment. Do you worry that things will be even more volatile, Serge, for, for what they've been so far? Well, you know, everything can happen, of course. Uh, we are still missing a major escalation of the geopolitical events. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, having said that, if, if I look at what happened in, uh, in Ukraine, what happened, what's happening right now in the Middle East, and, you know, it's, it's quite, you know, it's, it's already quite challenging. So uh, I am relieved that, at the very least, uh, the situation uh, 
between uh, China and the US uh, is uh, calming down. And uh, at this stage, we, we just don't need something else coming, for sure. Are, are you confident, actually, that the US-China relationship will get better? No, I'm not confident because I'm not in control of that. But, uh, <laughs> uh, but what, I'm, what, I, what I know is that uh, the world cannot afford an escalation. And, and most likely, both countries cannot really afford some things to escalate in terms of economic uh, consequences. I mean, uh, uh, the situation in both countries is fragile. And, uh, you know, I guess uh, a geopolitical escalation is not going to be in the interest of uh, both countries. What does that mean for the economy, the uncertainties in the economy and interest rates and, and how central banks view the future? Well, central banks uh, seems to also have a very little visibility about uh, what's happening. You see the uh, uh, stop and go um, um, uh, approach on, on rates. Uh, I think that uh, the last round was a sensible uh, pose. But uh, having said that, uh, when I look at, um, you know, from our standpoint of view, my standpoint of view, uh, when I look at the language, I'm not so sure it's over. And I'm not so sure they really believe uh, uh, rates are, have peaked. Uh, I personally think that uh, I'm more in the camp of high for longer than higher for longer. Uh, but, uh, you, know, um, you know, I don't see how we can bring back inflation at target. Uh, everybody focuses very much on, on the big drop. But the truth of the matter is that inflation is well above target rates across the globe. And it's much stickier than we think. So, I don't see how you can bring back inflation without creating a, an economic uh, uh, downturn. We start to, to see it now, clearly in Europe, and most possibly also in the US uh, soon. So. So, so if you have interest rates high for longer, and there's an economic downturn, what breaks? Is it, is it companies defaulting? Is it commercial real estate? Are there other pockets in the market that you worry about? Look. I would say that companies, the vast majority of the companies are, are well placed in terms of capital position. I'm not so concerned at this stage about the private sector. Uh, there are, and, and, and if, you, if you want to look at you know, major events, right, black swan events or, or things that can really go wrong, history tells us that they usually come from government or real estate. So. I, I think that while we look at uh, the private sector, I think that the reality is that uh, the most fragile part of the equation, if I look at uh, uh, the real estate, commercial real estate markets uh, across the world, you know, uh, the post-COVID uh, uh, positive momentum was, was very short. So, and uh, now the reality is that we see that uh, COVID has changed the way people work. People use uh, offices and, uh, you know, we see it as we speak that... Uh, that one has to be watched carefully. But commercial real estate, I mean, we talk about it so often, and it's been telegraphed so much, that sh surely a lot of the positions are starting to be unwound. Are, are starting to be unwound. That, I mean, if you talk about it as being a big event... Right. But, but also there is another element, because more and more, also on com commercial real estate, if you don't have uh, um, uh, buildings that are up to the new, newest... Uh, um, uh, ESG standard or climate uh, protection standards, you, you really have a trouble to rent it, no matter at what price you want to do it. So I think that there is also a, uh, rightly so in my point of view, a push for making sure that we create a more sustainable uh, uh, kind of uh, um, you know, a landscape in terms of real estates. And so there is a double whammy. Uh, Less demand, but and, and if there is demand, is very specific on new buildings or refurbished business uh, buildings that have um, the quality standards and, and the sustainability standards necessary. Sergio, you probably have the, the hardest actually job in banking right now because you're you're flying a plane whilst building a plane, right? Because you also have to to deal with Credit Suisse. How much time do you spend on each? Well, the first 90, 100 days was at 90 percent on, on the integration. Right now, it's coming down, but it's still very substantial. I don't expect this to change dramatically from kind of two-third, one-third. Uh, but it's true that, uh, you know, what I need to pay attention, and, and we need to pay attention, that clients, I mean, we spoke about the macroeconomic conditions, everything that goes on. 
you know, we need to continue to stay close to clients. We need to run the business. There is a day-to-day -day business, there is an integration business, and as we speak, we also see a lot of changes affecting our economies and our way, uh, the way we operate as a bank. You know, the digitalization, technology, artificial intelligence is changing the way we're going to work in the next three to five years. So the, the real challenge right now for us is not to be stuck into integrating the bank using the model we had in the last five years or we have today, but rather also thinking how it's going to be in three to five years' time. So I can't and you know, all, all of us in, in the bank cannot afford to be distracted from the clients and from a forward-looking aspect of what we need to do. Do you think client behavior is changing? Client behavior in, in respect of... Uh, Just in general, because of the fintech, because of their expectations and their relationship with their... No, family. at this stage, I don't see it uh, is an evolution. I mean, uh, usually the expectations of, uh, of uh, in general, the market and everybody about how fast the technology really changes the business is overestimated. But the impact over the long run is underestimated. Uh, no, the only thing that I saw really changing in clients' dynamics and, and is, is really more on the asset allocation side, these higher rates have shifted the asset allocation thinking of clients in, in back to a more traditional heavy component on bonds, on, 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 on you know, basically people are saying with 6.5% six, six kind of yield, 7% even with pretty good quality, you know, do I really need to have risks? You know, and uh, that has changed. And, um, uh, but it's a reflection of both uh, risk aversion, but also the attractiveness of uh, fixed income uh, in, in, in the asset allocation. How much are you focusing on Asia? Well, Asia is still uh, you know, a fantastic uh, growing story for us. Uh, for the last 20 years, uh, it's going to be for the next 20 to 30 years. We are in 13 countries here, uh, only, you know, we are in Singapore today, we employ 5,000 people in, a, in Singapore, the two banks combined. So we are managing 650 billions of assets, clients' assets, so it's, it's, and it's growing. So uh, wealth creation is in, in this side of the world and, in, in, you know, the underlying trends supporting wealth management are intact, particularly in this uh, region. So we need to continue to uh, look at way to to to, uh, to lever that, uh, and uh, the momentum is good. Although I have to say that, of course, when you come here now compared to four or five years ago, you see some convergence mm -hmm. to what we see in Europe and, and the U.S. in terms of uh, uh, economic developments, uh, uncertainties, and uh, coming from uh, different fronts. So. Sir, so you've also had a good 24 hours because of the 81s, right? UBS is back in 81s, and the demand for that was pretty incredible. Yeah, that, I, I have to say that uh, we were very pleased. I'm very pleased to see that. Now, of course, you never want to do, come out with any, uh, any, uh, any new issue that is not performing, but uh, I would say it's probably one of the highlights that we saw in the last seven months because, uh, in a sense, is. Uh, you know, creating $36 billion of demand uh, uh, for an instrument and a situation in which, until very recently, uh, people would say the 81 market is no longer you know, an investable market or for sure not for a Swiss bank. Actually uh, creating a record demand for the instrument, it's a testament of the confidence, not only in UBS, but I do think also to the fact that uh, uh, to the Swiss uh, system, to the Swiss uh, financial systems. Uh, and people are slowly but surely recognizing that uh, that event in March was an idiosyncratic event. And the necessity to trigger whatever needed to be triggered was inevitable. So do you think that that means that actually the trend, the appetite for AT1s will, will continue? Well, I mean, looks is it like, looks like uh, if, I, if I look at the kind of demand we got, uh, I do think that uh, people understand that uh, the 81 is a very important element of our capital uh, stack. And, uh, and of course, we have the credibility uh, to continue to use it. And it's very, 
is very good because we are accommodating a big demand for semi fixing hybrid fixed income, but at the same time is very beneficial to our shareholders because this is loss absorbing capital that has a very attractive uh, terms in terms you know, on a pre tax um, on an after tax basis sorry in terms of cost of capital so it's a very efficient way for us to you know recalibrate our capital base so how do you view the banking sector as a whole do you, i mean can european banks really challenge wall street but look you know i i, I think that what uh, in general i would say that uh, in, in, in certain areas of the business, it's not advisable to try to compete uh, uh, with uh, the incumbent uh, players who are by now very dominant. Uh, if you do so, you have to be very focused, like we do in, uh, in, in wealth management, where we are a global leader. Uh, we, we manage 3.7 trillion of assets. We are not the largest in the US, but we still manage uh, uh, a big chunk, 1.7 trillion is US clients. So uh, we see a lot of growth of potentials uh, in, in the U.S. Uh, if you think about uh, only, only a few years ago, uh, there was 12,000 people with more than 100 million in, in assets. And right now we have 36,000, so in, in five, six years. So the, the, the market is growing. So if you want to compete in those segments and if you have the capabilities, yes. In broader banking, commercial banking and universal banking is not advisable. But who do you see as your greatest competitor in wealth management? Well, um, you know, I, don't, uh, I think that uh, the incumbent local competitors uh, are, are known. So uh, the big names, uh, they are all uh, uh, quite uh, present. Uh, you know, our differentiating factors is that we are probably the only one who has a truly global reach in being a, an important player, not only in the U.S., but also number one in Latin America, number one by far in, in Asia, number one in, in uh, uh, Europe, and, and in Switzerland. So we, we try to differentiate ourselves. You know, we are more, you know, I would say, horizontal in the way we cover the sector, and uh, our U.S. peers are much more um, uh, U.S.-centric. Do, do you see regula how do you see regulation developing, actually, for, for global banks? Excuse me? Regulation? How uh, is regulation. it developing? In well, regulations, uh, of course, uh, you know, there is, uh, first of all, the finalization of Basel III is something that we, we knew, we anticipated. Uh, you know, that's the reason why, for example, for us, it's going to increase uh, our capital requirements by mm, maximum 5%. Uh, so it's... Uh, it's okay and actually is, is good that we finalize the implementation of this so that we can create a true level playing field. Uh, uh, I'm glad to see that the aftermath of what happened in March uh, haven't come to the conclusion that we need more capital or liquidity. Uh, if you look at what happened in the regional banks uh, in the US, it is clear that the same regulation or you know, a big chunk of the regulation that is applied to larger institutions mm -hmm. should be applied to big banks. You know, you know, particularly if you talk about 250 to, you know, 300 uh, billions of balance sheet, you should have a little bit more advanced methodologies in, in the way you manage treasuries than the one we saw. Um, and, uh, and, and, and in, in fact, uh, the larger banks, the GCF banks, were a safe haven, except one which had a very idiosyncratic uh, problem. So we don't need more capital. We don't need more um, liquidity requirement per se, but we need to recognize that uh, a run on a bank nowadays is much different than it was uh, five, ten years ago. In very few seconds, you can move out money from, uh, from the bank. And so we need to take in account how we calibrate liquidity requirements, but also how we make the balance sheet of banks more eligible for uh, uh, access to the central bank window so that in case of an emergency, you know, you know, there is at least a, a larger buffer of liquidity available to sustain a, a, a crisis. But do you see, for example, regulators asking for a different base of depositors to avoid basically a bank run on mobile? 
Well, that's not so easy because, yes, I, I think that more than a different base of depositor, a different tiering of, uh, of the deposits in terms of uh, maturity, uh, that's something that we always try to do. But it's not yet the end of the problem because if a bank is under stress, as those deposits are rolling off, you're still going to have the same problem. So it's very important to make sure that the quality of the assets are, is good enough to make them eligible to the central bank window. And that in itself is going to stabilize a crisis. It's not going to resolve a business model issue of a bank, but at least it, it can avoid conflicts or contagions uh, in the rest of the system. So that's the biggest lesson, uh, lesson learned from, from, from the crisis in, in, uh, in April. Sergio, when you look at the integration, I mean, it's hard because a lot of it, you rely a lot on talent, talented bankers, and with that goes culture. So in these big integrations, it's always been culture in the past that's been a problem. How do you deal with that? Well, look, we, 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 uh, we, on, we are onboarding the new colleagues of, of CS uh, with the right spirit. I don't think that per se there is a cultural clash between the two organizations. We have been competing very fiercely, but basically more or less with the same business model. Uh, what is helping us is that, of course, this is a uh, UBS-led acquisition, processes, policies, uh, uh, risk management uh, approaches are UBS. So we just clarified this matter in a way that, uh, you know, in my point of view, avoids, you know, potential uh, conflicts. So. Of course, in some cases, it's not easy. We are not trying to say that we are, per se, always the better solution, but it's the fastest and the one that guarantees, also in respect of uh, onboarding and understanding each other, how we operate. If we try to debate too much on what is the best way of doing business, we would yeah. not only delay uh, the integration, but also potentially create some clash. I, I know that a lot of people in the audience are chief executives that have to deal with the talent and people they hire. You, you spent $500 million on talent retention. How do, you, how do you choose who you keep? Well, look, you know, first of all, if you look at, uh, in, in the big scheme of, uh, you know, in, in any m &A, not only in, in banking, uh, usually there are retention uh, that in many cases, in our case, is going through... Uh, also in order to make sure that uh, enough people are staying to guarantee the well-functioning of the banks. Because as we speak, and I'm talking about functions like in risk management, in compliance, in finance, and not only on, for, for producers. So people think that we are talking about producers, but in effect, what we need to do is to make sure we continue to have operational stability. It's very important. We are still running two GCFs. It's, you know, UBS as an holding, but we have two systemic relevant uh, institutions, financial institutions, uh, uh, up and running. So we need to make sure that we are fulfilling regulatory requirements and uh, the, the expectation of, 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 uh, of, of clients. So that's a good investment that allow us then to create value over time. But you've also moved some $5 billion in wealth management assets to the wind down unit, right? Like a bad bank. How do you choose what goes in that? Well, the vast majority was, uh, to be honest, already pre-selected by, by, by Credit Suisse. So what we uh, put on top of it are uh, some businesses or relationships that we felt uh, were not uh, in line with our policies and guidance. But the vast majority was uh, containing uh, and defining the perimeter, which we did as of the end of September, and start the execution. Actually, since we took on de facto the management and uh, in, um, in April we took down uh, the non-core uh, assets by 30% and uh, another 50% of what is left as we speak is going to run off uh, naturally and, but we clearly going to accelerate that uh, runoff uh, in the next few uh, quarters and years. Sergio, what does your chairman think of you being called the George Clooney of Paraderplatz which, which is true? What he thinks? <laughs> yeah, what does he think? I don't know what he thinks, but I, <laughs> he, he reminds me all the time and he reminds everybody I meet so that I started to tell him, 
if I'm George Clooney, you are Marlon Brando. And he was all happy about that. And, <laughs> but then I told you, wait a second, I'm talking about the one of, of the Godfather, not the young one. <laughs> so, and so we, we took it that way. So. Sergio, thank you so much for joining us thank today. You. Thank you. Thank you. Bloomberg's Francine Lockwood there with UBS Group CEO Sergio Armadi. Of course, that at the Bloomberg New Economy Forum in Singapore, basically saying that, uh, uh, several things, hitting many issues from China to uh, the, their presence in Asia as well. Even talking about liquidity rules, saying that the 18-1 demand is seeing a confidence in the Swiss system after their take on simply the issues that you are seeing in terms of appetite to the exposure of Credit Suisse. Of course, we know that was a big issue as well. The fact that they saw that record demand was really important. And UBS's Armadi as well, saying that the AT1 was a very important element of stack. He also talked about regulation as well, saying that uh, they need to increase the capital requirement by a max of about 5%. You can get all those headlines, of course, on your Bloomberg terminal. I want to pivot, though, from some corporate news and talk about Airbus. Those shares a touch lower this morning. After missing profit estimates, the European plane maker saying it will significantly increase aircraft output next year. It's, of course, ramping up production across its range to meet the surging demand. Airbus CEO Guillaume Fari spoke to Bloomberg's Romain Bostic and Guy Johnson. The single aisle business, so the uh, short and, and mid-range activity, will continue to uh, dominate a number of planes. Uh, we've seen the activity on the single aisle recovering much faster after covid than it was for uh, wide bodies, for long range. Uh, but we think long range will follow up, will also uh, recover first and probably even stronger moving forward. And when we look at the long term perspectives for the, uh, for the market, we expect both single aisle and wide bodies uh, to significantly grow uh, to the extent that uh, we believe there will be around 40,000 planes uh, to be delivered in the next 20 years. Guillaume, you're ramping up, as you just confirmed to me, the, the 350 program. You're going to go to 10 a month, 2026. That's not a big push higher. You're basically going from 8 to 9 to 10 by 2026. Picking up on Romain's point, is that you, talk, you signaling caution that you actually think the, the big push we're seeing for long-haul demand at the moment is not sustainable? Could you take that program higher by that point if demand remains as robust as it is now? Well, actually, we see the demand growing. We see a recovery in the demand. And uh, we were at a low point of rate 4 on the A350 during COVID. So we went from 4 and, and we, we keep growing and we are now targeting 10. Uh, it's uh, slightly or it's very comparable to what we had pre-COVID. And we had said that the traffic itself would be recovering um, back to pre-COVID levels uh, between 23 to 25, 2023 to 2025. Um, so I think we are consistent uh, with the evaluation, the assessment we made of the recovery yeah. of the market going just out of COVID. Do we have the potential for more? Yes. The A350 has the potential to go up to rate 13 based on the existing production system. And we will continue to monitor the demand, the recovery of the demand, with a big replacement cycle for white bodies that is just starting, uh, and also some uh, expectations for growth. So the market has the potential to go higher, and we have the potential to continue to serve that market by further ramping up. But I'd like to just confirm that rate 10 on the A350 is already a very big number.